Hi, everybody. It's Mary Rowe from the Canadian Urban Institute. I'm so uh, excited to see all of you. Um, that uh, people are coming in on a different time uh, because people get uh, become creatures of habit. And so the West Coast is used to having morning coffee with us at nine and the East Coast is used to just getting ready for a little uh, mid-afternoon nap. And then the Eastern guys are normally having their lunch. So thanks for those of you that delayed your lunch break. We're appreciative to have you here. Um, City Talk has been running since uh, late March, 2020. And uh, we were just saying backstage that uh, we don't know how many of these we've actually done, but when we first started them, none of us knew what Zoom was. None of us knew what Teams was or any of these platforms. And now they're just part of our daily lives. And I uh, work around the country and I go to various meetings and it happened today. I went and uh, did a session for the Board of Trade in Toronto and uh, a table of people came to speak to me about how uh, important these city talk sessions have been for people practicing different aspects of city building and urban life, uh, learning about each other, what's going on across the country, and then learning about aspects of city building that they don't know much about or that they know they need to know more about. Um, and so I appreciate everybody continuing to stick with us and be part of these uh, sessions. And we're very uh, stuck on our format. We do them in an hour. Uh, we invite people from across the country and different perspectives to give us a sense of what's working, what's not, and what's next. Uh, and then we record them, as everyone knows, and we record the chat. And there's a whole parallel universe in that chat of people who I know right now are identifying who they are, where they're coming from, and what their ancestral territory is that they happen to be uh, landed in. So um, we then uh, post these on the website, and then people use them. And I was just suggesting that lots of university classes are using them. And so I think as we move to, believe it or not, a thousand days of COVID, which will be December 6, 7, um, it's really important that we take time to learn and that we take time to understand what have we collectively been through and what can we learn going forward in terms of improving the way we build cities. And what better topic to do than this one to talk about uh, uh, indigenous experiences of housing that predate the, the pande pandemic and then predate actually uh, settlers arriving. And so how uh, important for us to have this conversation with our Indigenous colleagues and also to recognize that uh, Friday is Orange Shirt Day, uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day, and that uh, we appreciate that these folks are really busy this week. So thank you for making the time. As I said, I'm in Toronto, which is the traditional territory, unceded ancestral territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, um, and, and uh, home to uh, diverse Inuit First Nations and Métis peoples. And we have, uh, I would say at CUI, had a number of experiences of, of being uh, challenged about the history of urbanism being an exclusive one uh, and the practices of colonialism basically uh, uh, being uh, expressed through how we build communities and how we build much of urban life. And how do we come to terms with that? How do we come to terms with the truth of that? And then how do we move to what true reconciliation will look like? So uh, I appreciate uh, our Indigenous uh, our colleagues coming on this call with us to have, and I know that we'll have many Indigenous in the, um, cybersphere in the audience too. So uh, we always say these conversations aren't the end, they're the beginning and, uh, and, and it's a process. And how do we actually come to terms with these broken treaties and figure out where we go next? And uh, housing is a pressing challenge in almost every Canadian community, but particularly in vulnerable populations and a very particular specific kind of challenge that Indigenous communities are facing, Indigenous people working and living in urban environments or in community environments or in their uh, traditional environments. So the conversation is going to cover all of that in an hour. Got it? So we're on it. Um, these folks all talk fast. And um, if I could encourage you to use that little frame of what's been working, what's not, and what's next. Uh, a number of you have been involved with the National Housing Council, who has been uh, reviewing the National Housing Strategy to figure out where it's been falling down or not. And there's been very specific uh, focus there that the Indigenous community has weighed in on. So we're always interested in specific, tangible examples of changes that need to be initiated uh, to actually make uh, the housing system work uh, more equitably and more effectively. So I'm going to go around the room if I can. I appreciate we've got people coming in from different parts of the country, um, off-grid, on-grid, hotel rooms, 
uh, uh, displaced, whatever. Uh, some people have recently retired. Sylvia, you're looking good. Recently retired, congratulations. Uh, and then some of us still in the trenches. So um, we really appreciate a diverse view. And I'm gonna start actually with Sylvia, if I may. Uh, and uh, uh, the all the presenters' bios are put into the chat, as people know, so you can read great details about Sylvia. And I'm very pleased to have you come, Sylvia, to City Talk and give us a perspective from your sense about what's working, what's not, and what do you think needs to be next? around housing for indigenous communities. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I probably wanna start with a comment that um, where cities and towns uh, in particular were built across this country where people who enjoy uh, rural environments and Northern environments, um, quite frankly, they were settled by us. Uh, and people forget that. So, so the whole notion of, of, of urbanization or, or of housing um, should come from a framework that why wouldn't we have picked the best places ourselves and, uh, and being dis displaced, dis dispossessed for, from that. And so I, I think as, a, as part of a bigger experience that Canada is having with respect to reconciliation, we we need to know our history and we need to learn facts and 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 uh, go perhaps go back uh, to uh, to some of those uh, things and um so what's working is uh, is indigenous people articulating the need for housing where it should be what it should look like uh, it may not look like everyone else's it may look like a much more integrated community uh, it uh, it will have some space and place uh, where we can practice who we are and remember who we are. What's not working? The uh, most of the system isn't working. Uh, the fact that there isn't safe housing, that there's not available housing, that there's not affordable housing, that we're not planning for the future, that where the costs of attempting to do any of this work is astronomical. Uh, that, you know, we, we have over, I mean, the, the, the number says we have over 325,000 people homeless in any given day. That number, I'm sure, is not accurate. Uh, that, that should be appalling to all of us uh, in this country. And, uh, and I think uh, even worse than that is probably that 30% or more of that population are Indigenous. Yet we are only representing, you know, a little over, uh, you know, three, four percent of the population. Our population is growing and it's young. There are no opportunities for young people. There are no specialized houses. We can't take care of people who are aging or people who have mental health needs or, or, or the 2S LGBTQI plus community. And, uh, and, and we need to do it. And we can't, we plan this forever. We've had experiences of success and so why do we have to go through all the planning again? Um, sooner or later, it, it's literally hammers, nails, and concrete on, on the ground. And, uh, and what should be happening next? Uh, there should be an urban, rural, and northern indigenous strategy that the First Nations, the Métis, and the Inuit who were given uh, housing allocations uh, should make sure that builds start in the community with people being invested. And that, quite frankly, as part of reconciliation, that we look at um, allocations of housing uh, to uh, certainly for urban, indigenous, and northern uh, people who uh, uh, who are in, in our communities. And um, we have to go back to, uh, to peace and friendship and making sure that basic needs are met. So that'll be my opening salvo, if you want. Yeah, Sylvia, where are you calling in from? I, 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 well, I call in from Toronto. I prefer to, uh, to talk about the history of Toronto as part of uh, the St. Lawrence and, and Great Lakes, uh, one dish, one spoon. Uh, that before, uh, you know, in, uh, in the 11, early 1100s, uh, uh, and all of the uh, nations uh, in that area got together and made a treaty of, of peace and friendship. And it was called One Dish, One Spoon, because this is all we have to live, and that we need to learn how to share it, uh, that we need to, uh, to be kind uh, with each other. And, and in those days, they had already the prophecies that uh, people would come here 
and uh, and that they would uh, and that we would need to protect uh, the the water the land uh, the animals in particular and of course uh, we know that that prophecy came true and we should return to thinking about how do how do we live together we don't have to be the same but how do we uh, how do we live together so that's where i come from thank you you know I, i'm interested in this you know, way of knowing that you look back in terms of what, how we historically may have actually answered some of these challenges and then how do we then take what we know uh, or that we've forgotten and then see if there are ways for us to move forward. And I think that's part of the, I think that's, as you say, um, and I'm sure I'm gonna hear this from other panelists, there, there's an element of, we know what actually needs to happen here and what are the impediments for us to actually be able to create the conditions to build the housing we need. And also, I appreciate your other point, Sylvia, that it's not just housing. It's a whole bunch of things that make your collective life possible. And so it's not just one, it's no, no quick fix. I'm going to go to you next, Justin, if I could. If you could just tell us where you're coming in from and then some quick intro comments about what do you think is working, what's not, and what do you think should be next? Thanks, Miigwech, Mary. Um, I'm calling in today from Adawa, uh, more recently known as, uh, as Ottawa, which is the unceded land of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Uh, I'm based in Bawating, uh, Sault Ste. Marie. Um, I'm the CEO of the organization that Sylvia founded. Uh, Sylvia and others founded uh, about three decades ago, uh, Ontario Aboriginal Housing Services. Uh, what's working right now is community led Indigenous housing. Um, and we we know what works because we've been doing it for three decades. Um, we have culture-based housing that uh, is paired with uh, culture-based supports to give people the, the help that they need to get to where it is they want in their own journey, in their own life's path. And we know that that's how, um, that's how you break cycles of poverty. That's how we break this international sorry, intergenerational trauma and create intergenerational <laughs> prosperity. So we know what, we know what works. Um, what doesn't work is continued paternalism in, various, in its various formats, whether that is uh, government-led and government-directed programs and services. We've, we've tried that for about 150 years and, and it's gotten us um, into the position we are right now. It also rears its head in the form of uh, mainstream organizations trying to take the lead on, on solving their, their perception of what the issues are. Um, and we know that that, we know that that doesn't work. And, and that in, you know, in its, in its ugliest sense could be a form of uh, various levels of government contracting out uh, a practice of colonialization, right? So we know that that doesn't work. Um, in terms of what's next, uh, we're at a really interesting inflection point here where uh, Canadians are understanding the hard truths, um, some of which include that the fact there are more children, more Indigenous children in care right now than there were at the height of residential schools. Canada is setting itself up for another apology in the next two decades to those children who have been taken and are being taken from their families, from their communities. Um, we know that the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls Report mentioned housing 299 times, both the lack of which being a contributing cause to violence and the provision of which being um, a hopeful contribution to, to a better place for, for everyone. So if we can get to that point now, um, and this has been called on, and I'm going to repeat Sylvia's, uh, Sylvia's call here, we need we need a for Indigenous, by Indigenous, urban, rural, and Northern housing strategy for the 86% of Indigenous people who live in urban, rural, and Northern areas. And this is a really good opportunity for Canada, who has been saying the right words for a number of years now. This is a really good opportunity for Canada to work in partnership with us to actually action those words. Wow, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of moments in this session where we're just gonna to have to take a bit of a breath. Um, 
I what I'm just and I'm interested your your comments about uh, that that you have a model community based led by the community designed by the community managed by the community wraparound supports offered by the community and I'm interested what your reflection is about if if we know that model works what's preventing us from actually implementing it more robustly in other communities let's say well, that's a really good question, Mary. Um, we've shown that this works. And um, I suppose that's more of a question for uh, for Canada uh, yeah. as to why they're why they're not doing it. We've been pushing on this for decades and decades. Yeah. And um, whether it's a, a fear of change, uh, I'm not really sure, but uh, as I mentioned, this is an opportunity uh, for 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 everyone to walk to walk together. Um, you know, I have a question about this, about whether then I'm going to come to you, Margaret, and then Marie, you'll do clean up on this. Um, if part of it is uh, scale, because the how and I'll be I'll just throw this out there and we can all have a go at it when when you're all finished in your intros, whether or not because housing historically in Canada um was built at you know large scale subdivisions you know the army built housing years ago is part of the dilemma is that we don't have uh systems to support at the community level i don't know i'm just throwing that out think about that justin and we'll come back to you margaret i'm going to come to you next at some uh you're in the nation's capital i think or you're in canada's capital whichever nation that is i think you're in ottawa in a hotel room thank you for making time because i think you've been on the hill with the housing renewal association all week right we have been, and one of the pleasures and joys of, uh, of this talk is that I've been working with Justin all week, and so he kind of stole a little bit of uh, some of the common themes that we've been talking about, so I won't reiterate them. Uh, and of course, Sylvia, as the uh, one of the chairs of the National Housing Council, uh, has had a lot of work with our community in terms of creating the recommendations that went to the government around some of the gaps in the national housing strategy. So just to, to keep it formal, in the eat, hello, in the language of my Simshan ancestors, and Shagwalgalak, uh, which means uh, our fire is lit. Welcome. We encourage you to come and sit with us. So thank you, Toyek Sim. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I, I think probably the most important uh, thing for me is that I flew in with Jagmeet Singh uh, to come to Ottawa here earlier this week. And uh, I, you know, I try to be very respectful of our elected officials that they they have a right to their time and their privacy as well. And uh, I grabbed the last 10 minutes of our flight to 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 slap him with our annual report, the Aboriginal Housing Management Association's annual report. You guys can find it on our website at ahma-bc.org under resources and reports. Uh, our, our title was called Advancing Human Rights, and, and Marie will speak to this a little bit more later. But one of the things that we've really, really struggled against that hasn't been working is helping Canadians understand that Indigenous rights are human rights, that housing rights are human rights, and that the old cliche of government, one of the barriers to why we don't get things moving in, a, in an efficient manner beyond your scale question, is the reality that I think it's very comfortable to believe that we as Indigenous peoples, we as not-for-profits, lack capacity in some way, shape, or form. And so one of the things that I am particularly fond of in our annual report under Advancing Human Rights is the ability to allocate numerous pages of that annual report to the economic strength and capacity of our providers, not of AMA, but of the 55 housing providers that have been in our province in BC for over 50 years that have demonstrated their economic capacity, that have demonstrated their professional capacity, that have demonstrated that they get the gap between distinctions-based strategies and urban Indigenous strategies. And so that's all encompassed in that annual report. And I wanted to get it to jug meat because I wanted to kill the argument before it even started that there might be some capacity issue with Indigenous peoples to meet the needs of their own communities. 
if there's any capacity issue, it's strictly a funding issue uh, more than anything else. I mean, other than what the world has witnessed since COVID, you know, with the economic crisis and recruitment and retention and all those those things. But what I what I will say, my personal connection to this, uh, and I've been doing this for over 28 years, and I tell everybody, my daughter's 29, and she'll laugh if she's listening. Uh, I always tell everybody that my daughter's first word was not mama. It, in fact, was AMA because I've been fighting for the Aboriginal Housing Management Association for 28 years. We just celebrated 25 years. Uh, and, and recently, over the last five years, this November marks five years since the first national housing strategy was launched here in Canada. Noticeably absent was the inclusion of Canada's Indigenous peoples, full stop. Layered within that is federal government's ongoing failure to recognize urban Indigenous peoples and their inherent inherent rights that we never ceded simply because we are dispossessed from our direct connections to our distinctions-based communities. And I'm one of them in particular being a 60s group child. I don't have my cultural connection, but I do still have my inherent rights to self-determination. But if the world didn't recognize the complexity of issues that we as Canada's First Peoples continue to face, most certainly the affirmations beginning with Kamloops, 215 last year, rising to well over 10,000 affirmations of the children that never made it home. And I want to say, talk about a moment of pause. This is probably going to be a triggering conversation for those that have experienced the legacy of our residential, I can't even say schools, because where else do children who graduate from school call yourself a survivor versus those that did not make it home from those to their home communities. But that backdrop illustrates our ongoing vulnerability as Indigenous peoples and the deep emotional responses that, you know, that we have to Canada's ongoing failure to include us as the dispossessed from the distinctions-based focus. And so layering on all of those challenges for Indigenous leaders adds to the urgency for a culturally and trauma-informed response from the Canadian government on the national housing strategy. And we tabled our first ever for Indigenous by Indigenous housing strategy on January 26th of this year. Uh, and, and it really is more than about filling the gap that government didn't do. It's about demonstrating once again that Indigenous people have strength. They have voice and they know what they need and they know how to implement it. That's what we're, we're asking the government to recognize. And Justin and I have spent the last week, as you, you highlighted, at Housing on the Hill, advocating for government officials to understand that ongoing neglect of urban Indigenous people, ongoing failure to include us in a culturally and trauma-informed manner, will only exacerbate the vulnerability of our community and that we as leaders will have no other choice but to go to the United Nations to raise the profile of these ongoing violation of our basic human rights. And we've said this much to CMHC, we've said this much to Minister Hassan, and I recently just talked to the PMO's office indicating that we'll have to go down that avenue if we cannot see tangible timelines set in place and implementation of all of the recommendations that came out of HUMA, the National Housing Council, the INN witnessing. I mean, how many more research studies do we need for them to know what needs to be done? Yeah, we're back to really when we know what to do, what is preventing us from doing the right thing. Margaret, it sounds like you're covering the waterfront, including uh, talking to people on the plane. So uh, uh, <laughs> you're going to wear them down eventually. But I, I think this question of a kind of a historical paternalism that exists, and uh, we can see, I see that in other jurisdictions too. And uh, it's uh, it's fundamental. Your I feel those of you that are advocating for housing as a human right are basically saying that we we are entitled to self determine, and that housing is part of that self determination, and governments should be enabling that. So I appreciate very much the perspective you're offering, Marie. We lost you for a minute. Um, you missed Margaret's eloquence, but you know her, so you probably have a you have the gist of probably what she covered. Um, uh, I'm going to turn to you now, and uh, if you could just let us know where you're coming in from. And I appreciate that your internet may be a bit spotty, but let's hope you you can um, hopefully your connection will be stable for you to tell us a little bit about your perspective of what's working, what's not, and what's next. Oh, 
Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Marie McGregor Kirawanaquat. I live in Dogening. Uh, in English, it's called South Bay, uh, south end of Wikwemakong on Manitoulin Island. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, what works is um, Indigenous women being able to exercise agency, independence, self-sufficiency. And I can speak from experience when, when I was evicted from my original family home at Whitefish River First Nation, I went out and uh, found a place in the bush and I used a tent in the beginning. Then I graduated to a one room sleeping bunkie. <laughs> and then from there added another room to it. Now I had a two room tiny home. And then from there, I took the carpentry program in Wiki in 2016 and added the third room to my tiny home. Then finally in 2018, the chief and council of Whitefish River decided that they did not like elders being on their own. And so they evicted me from the reserve. From there, I went off to Wikwemkong, my mother's home territory, and they accepted me as a member of the Wikwemkong unceded territory. Um, when you talk about what works, um, I'm working on a training program so that Indigenous people and gender diverse people can learn to build our own homes from natural materials. And also, to if the codes and the regulations and the building supply organizations are not there to assist us, then we go around them, we go without them, and we use the materials that are at hand. Um, the other thing that does not work is uh, insecure land tenure, which is what happens on Indian reserves. If you think of Canada as consisting of 100 squares, think of one of those squares. Now think of two tenths of one square. The two tenths of one square is all the land that's left to us on Indian reserves. And even that is not owned by Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. All it is, is the permission of the federal government to use and occupy. So in effect, if you think about that the lands have never been properly purchased from us, and there's no purchase receipt to show us that our lands have not been purchased from us, then we still own those lands. If the terms of the treaties have not been enforced, then the treaties become null and void. A treaty can only be made between sovereign indigenous nations and the British crown who happened to be here at the time. So that means that we can exercise ownership over our ancestral traditional lands in Canada. That's what will work. Uh, having cookie cutter box houses on an Indian res reserve does not work because it does not take into account clan structure, does not take into account traditional activities, that need to be done out on the lands. And it uh, forces us together into what I call the four C's, contained, corralled, controlled, and counted. And if you think about urban environments, uh, think about your own in living arrangement, for example, you're also a subject of a four C. Because of your loan with the bank, you will have to pay on your mortgage. You are also corralled, contained, controlled, and counted. So, we have some things in common and also some things that are different. And what's different is that we have our connection to the land, that we need to find our way back to the land. That's where we come from. And the, the earth itself is a living, or living organism that's alive and that brought us to life. And so that's how we see our lands. There's a thing called uh, spiritual homelessness a term that was coined by Jesse Thistle. My understanding of it is that when you're traveling around on Great Turtle Island, the North, Central, and South Americas, wherever you go, if you see a fence, it says keep out. You see a concrete barrier that says no trespassing. You see another sign that says entry for prohibited. What that speaks to is that we are forbidden from entering our own home territories. And to me, that's kind of a heartbreak. There has to be a way to free up the land so that indigenous peoples are able to go back to live on our own lands again. Um, if you think that we've been here for 35 to 50,000 years before present, then over that 35,000 to 50,000 years before present, 
indigenous peoples were able to provide our own housing. And as Justin mentioned, over the last 150 years, we have had to conform and provide housing that meets the standards of Euro-Canadian, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant legal system. And when you think of it, what doesn't work is trying to conform to a foreign legal system. We have our own laws, Nishnabe laws. We were put here. We were put here to take care of the animals, the birds, the fish, the water, and the land. And if we're prevented from doing that, then what you have is an environmental crisis that's global in scope. We need to find our way back to our lands and start to take care of it and build our own housing again. Materials are all out there. There's stones, there's mud, there's trees, there's all kinds of stuff. And I'm sorry, my internet connection is going unstable, but I did want to put those comments out there. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you so much. It worked, Marie. We heard every word. And, and I, uh, I've been to Wekwamakong and I've been to Whitefish Falls, so I know how beautiful it is out that window behind you. <laughs> um, uh, you know, you, the four of you have talked um, at various scales. And I'm, I'm interested where you would say we should be putting our effort. Margaret's talking about storming the UN and going internationally. Uh, Justin was saying, look, I, I've got models that work at the hyper-local. Sylvia, you toiled in this vineyard for a long time in terms of trying to get federal and provincial policies to actually line up. And Marie is giving a really profound call out to allow, creating conditions for communities to, to, chat, to solve their own housing challenges and to not have these rules. So I'm wondering, Sylvia, in terms of your you know, this notion of intervention points in a system, I'm kind of stuck on it myself as I think about how we contribute, where we contribute. Where, if you, if you think of the next couple of years, Sylvia, where do you think the greatest opportunity for change is gonna be? You're muted. Everybody should just open your mics, guys. Justin, open your mic, Marie. It's just us now. So just open your mics and you okay. can all chorus in whenever you feel like talking. Go ahead, Sylvia. So I think that, that, that we have such a crisis in this country that we have to do, uh, that we have to, we, we have to try to make interventions everywhere. Yeah. Um, the small municipalities or large municipalities or, or towns need to identify along with provinces and territories, where do they, and I, I'm gonna use parentheses, own land. Where are buildings not being used? Where are offices that the government always wants a new monument to themselves and this is you know, too, too old or too whatever? Uh, you know, we tried to get a courthouse one time in Thunder Bay and make it into housing for youth getting out of care. And the town mm -hmm. said, oh, you can't use it for that. It, you know, whoa, whoa, why? Like it, it was a municipal vote. And, and I'll tell you that, that courthouses are usually provincial land, so they didn't even have the jurisdiction over it. So, know. so, yeah. so you have, you, you, you know, land is, land is a big issue, uh, a big issue. And, and as the conversation reconciliation talks about land back, give us some of the land back. Um, Justin and I worked with, with small municipalities in Northern Ontario who were always giving us land because their communities are dying. Right. And people are leaving them. And I said to, one day to Justin, as he was asking me to, you know, take forward another notion to our board. I said, don't just Indigenous people live in this small town now? Like we built all the houses. I don't know who else could be there. And uh, he sort of laughed and said, uh, not yet. So we could expect uh, 10 more lots being offered next year. And so, so I think you, ha you have to do that. And, and I think in, uh, in Toronto, uh, you know, and large cities like Vancouver and Montreal, you have tons of, of often old downtown cores. All those municipalities are interested in revitalizing their core and putting families and putting, you know, young, hip, you know, to s people and all kinds in those will, will bring that back. And, mm -hmm. and so I think you do it. I think um, 
provinces don't as they cut back their bureaucracies don't have the interface to manage a number of these issues right and and don't have people who are skilled actually in in, in urban planning or northern for that matter and uh, i don't i make no apologies uh, uh, to anyone who's listening uh, who, who does that work um but provinces have have to get in on this as well they have lots of land tenure and and responsibilities to build housing and you know i i was amazed at how quick the federal government could get uh ten dollar child care uh across the country i mean ontario was the last to hold out but but did it and yeah, it uh, and, I, it. and uh, so it's possible to do mm -hmm. and uh, and the federal government uh has to uh, go back it, it had a very significant role uh, up until the uh, 1980s and actually providing for supports and transfers uh, for housing and they have to get back in the business of housing mm -hmm. but the other side of this intervention is that i i was intrigued by your your notion of scale because I think really in Canada, regardless of where we live, we are a bunch of small communities. You mm -hmm. know, I live in the downtown core of, of Toronto, uh, around the market, and it's a small community. And, uh, you know, when you talk about uh, Gastown in Vancouver, you talk, I mean, we are a collection of villages that become unwieldy in some respects but i think uh, when you talk about scale and and i i i think both the work i've done with margaret and, and justin uh, we find that people do want to work together we don't find that people aren't interested and nowadays even developers are coming to us and developers are coming and saying can we do this and the fact of the matter it, it is and there are projects where people can can work together and get along and um, so, but at the basis of this, uh, Margaret, I think raised one of the issues, which is whether or not they think that we have, have the skills and the knowledge uh, to go through the experience. But the other thing is that fundamentally people have not decolonized, that, that individuals of us don't look at what is, what do we have to do? And we have to do it too, because we're used to, mm -hmm. you know, I, I come from, from the Mohawk Nation, uh, the Iroquois Confederacy, who chose not to make an agreement with the Crown uh, using the words great white father or king, but rather we will be brothers. Now, pre-consciousness in European history about the role that women play, which both Margaret and Marie have spoken to, um, but that we would be equal in terms of that word brother or sisters and going along on the path uh, together. And I think that that there is this enormous change societally going on in the country and we have to make amends which means we cannot do the same things the same way and so let's start to look at how do we how do how do how do we create a series of villages in communities or metropolitan areas where people can feel like they belong and they're not just outsiders and we're not just parallel playing well, and that's the truth in truth and reconciliation. And it's more than just a day on September 30th. It's about enacting change at all levels of government and all levels of community uh, before we will actually see successful implementation and sustainability of the solutions that Justin talked about that we've already evidenced for 39 years in his organization, 25 years in ours. 50 plus years in many of the native housing providers, that's the funding uh, programs that most of our providers across Canada were funded under initially, uh, they've been on the ground for 50 plus years and we can evidence that we've had that capacity. Um, but, but truth and reconciliation is about letting go of those old myths letting go of the stereotypes and the common belief that Indigenous people lack capacity or lack exp expertise. Uh, but the other piece, and I'm just going to touch on it with, uh, yeah, Sylvia talked about all levels of government. I was just at the UBCM, the Union of BC Municipalities event two weeks ago, and what I heard loud and clear from mayors and councillors from across the, the province of BC was that the federal government simply has not stepped up to the plate of the last 20 years, which makes sense since they got out of the housing realm in any way, shape or form to help alleviate the crisis that we're in right now. And that includes more than just the bricks and mortar of housing. We have 
neglected infrastructure. We have communities where if the river freezes, 150 homes are isolated from access to medical services, food services, their basic heating and, and, and electric supplies could be cut off. I mean, and they're stuck like that until the river thaws. And yet we have yet to address how to get them their utilities in a way that could sustain their weather environment. So there's a, there's a huge intersectionality at all levels of government needing to collaborate to provide the more holistic uh, solutions. And Sylvia talked about the whole land back piece. Land back isn't just about a distinctions-based focus. It's about recognizing that Indigenous people are inherent rights title owners as well and should be included and factored into those discussions when it comes to land back conversations. I mean, you really do have to operate at multiple levels here. I can hear that. And the land back notion, at least it, there's a tangibility to that, I think. Um, you know, it gives a government something to focus on, like find the land that you have. As you said, Sylvia, there are, we know examples across the country where there's a, a, a piece of land that's owned publicly that's sitting doing nothing. And the question is, can it be, could it not be made available? Justin, you have really double down on this it must be something to have the same name first name as the prime minister every time i heard sylvia talk i had to think which justin is she talking to she could be like margaret talking to the other justin on a plane but um you know when you're focusing on very, i'm sure you've talked with him too um when you're talking very tangible supports justin have you tried to hold all those things to be true somebody in the chat is asking what your general views are to the income uh, did anybody see this? I'll see if I can find it again, uh, that there's an initiative that's been done around distributing income and whether that's an intervention point, or do you think it's better to just do some projects, get some models? Go ahead, Justin, give us a sense. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mary. And uh, I'd love to debate the uh, the other Justin, as I call him. Uh, the, the national housing strategy, he was quoted as saying, no relationship is more important than our relationship with Indigenous people. Yet there we were at the back half of the national housing strategy and leaving out 86% of Indigenous people. Um, that, was, Crazy. that was almost five years ago. Yeah. Um, in terms of, uh, I, I'm not, not sure. Why do you, why, Justin, why did that happen? Again, that's probably a question for, for Canada, for, for Mr. Trudeau. Mm -hmm. um, but what I can say in terms of scale is that we are absolutely ready um, Mary, the, the federal government has been out of urban Indigenous housing for almost 29 years now, um, when, mm -hmm. when the urban Native housing programs were gutted, um, and the federal government has not returned in a meaningful way to urban Indigenous housing since then. Uh, when you talk mm -hmm. about scale, um, I, like, I call bunk on that, and the reason why I do is because, um, for example, in Ontario, we have 35 urban Indigenous housing providers, 30 friendship centers, almost 30 Métis councils, 10 Ontario Native women chapters, plus many more local councils, that despite the federal government's exit 29 years ago, we, our, own organ, or our own organization, for example, we grew from serving zero people to today serving 11,000 people. And that was without the without federal any... government support that we need. So imagine what we could do together yeah, if, if those words that were spoken are actually actioned, community members will come out in droves to make this happen. So scale is not scale is the last thing that I'm concerned about. In terms well, it's of interesting. Education. It's interesting. It's interesting. You built your own infrastructure, your social infrastructure of people working together, and now you you basically laid it out and said we just need federal support to come and make it possible for us to work collectively together. So you you self-organized, right? Even Absolutely. Though, yeah. Marie, what would you say to that? Um, can I you're, a, you're a good, you self-organized in terms of when you described the different stages that you've taken uh, post eviction. But in terms of what Justin is suggesting, I think what I guess what I meant with scale was more that we have a housing system that built big suburbs and that we didn't we, we didn't seem to we don't seem to have a housing system that can build in smaller increments. I, maybe I'm wrong about that, but maybe there's an opportunity for us to have the indigenous experience actually create more and more 
I'm assuming, but maybe not always, Justin, I was going to say not-for-profit housing, Indigenous-led housing, but we know there's a for-profit developer working in Vancouver, so maybe it doesn't have to be either. But Marie, what's your sense of what the next step would be that would be to support the community that you're familiar with? Um, when we're talking about um, housing, I keep coming back to agency and self-sufficiency mm -hmm. and independence. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, if you look at the um, homeless uh, arrangements that they have been able to make for themselves, they're mm -hmm. living in tents. And unfortunately, the media calls those encampments. They're not encampments, they're villages. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other problem with terminology is that uh, the lawyers called my tiny home structures. They weren't structures, it was a home. So right. the terminology is also very important. And so what needs to happen is for indigenous women, particularly single parent women, um, also the seniors and also those who are uh, getting lost in the cities, need to be able to learn how to build our own homes again. In, in pre-colonial times, Anishinaabe Kwek were responsible for putting up the homes. And it was the Anishinaabe and Ninuk that were responsible for defense and protecting territory. So we have a history of being able to provide our own housing. So what I see is first the training to be able to learn how to do these things. We also need the land back. Mm -hmm. in order to have a place to put a home. You, you can't talk about housing without also talking about the land. And unfortunately, in Canada now, we have a situation where real estate and housing is so financialized that you can't even begin to talk about it without thinking about, oh, we need to go and get a loan at the bank. Oh, I don't have a good credit score. Oh, I can't afford it. And how many people does that leave out? When in fact, if you exercise ownership over your own indigenous allodial land title, which exists in 99 and 8 tenths percent of Canada, then that's the beginning. Then women, I'm thinking of women in particular because that's who I am, can learn how to build our own homes again. And I'm not excluding anybody. Anybody that wants to learn how to build their own homes should be able to and get the trades training to be able to do that. Um, we kind of know how disrespectful the trades industry is to women, to gender diverse people, and we need to overcome that. We also know how, um, how much of an obstacle the building supplies industry is. When you think about the cost of building supplies that tripled just during the pandemic time, that put it out of reach even more of the ordinary person. And I keep thinking about the person in the tent in the city. That person exercised agency. No, it's not a two by four home. No, it's not stone. No, it's not masonry. But it is a framework with a cloth cover. And she, he, they are able to get shelter from the elements. For them, at that moment, that's their home. You know, I see those things as homes. And I see the places where they collect together. Those are villages. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and like Sylvia said, cities are not just cities. They're places where Indigenous peoples lived for thousands of years before present. Mm -hmm. And also, we were able to provide for ourselves in, in that period. Why can we not go back to providing for ourselves? But for now, we need, we need the codes and bylaws to make way for Indigenous people. We need some kind of a assistance to get it kick-started and off the ground and working. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, if they're too restrictive, then people are going to take matters into their own hands and start building stone houses and <laughs> teepees and wigwams and all kinds of structures to take care of themselves. <clears throat> and I think that's already happening out in the bush in Canada. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Marie, if I could add, uh, Marie, uh, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Marie a number of months ago as they were uh, working with the Keepers of the Circle and the Women's National Housing and Homelessness Network in launching a human rights uh, claim with the Federal Housing Advocate, uh, which we are still uh, journeying down that. But there was a, a lovely young woman and author, her name is Katlia. 
She released a book very recently called This House is Not a Home. And as we're coming up to the Truth and Reconciliation Day on the 30th, I would encourage everybody to, to get that book and read it because it really does kind of hit home on the issues that we're hearing here at this talk uh, about the reality of, of how 153 years of colonization has created an unsustainable system, not even for the Indigenous peoples, for First Nations, Métis and Inuit, but for everybody. Uh, and that's what we heard loud and clear at UBCM. But from an Indigenous lens, what we've been advocating and lobbying for full stop is that nothing about us without us, that they can't continue enacting policies and practices and programs that were designed not for Indigenous peoples and expect us to fit them. And it caused me great anxiety when I heard CMHC say the other day, and Justin, you and I didn't get a chance to, to speak to that uh, today when we met with CMHC, uh, because, of course, CMHC is trying to enact the recommendations out of the National Housing Council and out of HUMA. Uh, after a parliamentary change, which was their current uh, um, reason for not moving on progress, uh, um, their answer was, well, in the meantime, we're going to ramp up availability of existing national housing programs to Indigenous populations. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, if you're creating funding models and housing program models that were not designed with Indigenous people for Indigenous people, there's a high percentage that those solutions do not meet the basic core cultural trauma-informed needs of Indigenous peoples. And that's what's been failing. And so we're seeing government continue to make the same mistakes they made before they got out of the game 29 years ago, as Justin said. So we go back to the critical, you know, when I say storm the United Nations, it's really more about saying, we've been listening to you for five years, make promises of inclusion of urban Indigenous peoples, never mind the distinctions-based strategies that need to get rolled out. Uh, and we're seeing very little movement. And when they do speak of movement, we hear of dollars, but we don't hear about the actual measurable outcomes. So how many units did that translate to? How many senses of cultural safety and belonging did that translate to? They don't measure that. They don't map that because their strategies were not based for Indigenous people. And that's why strategies that are going to go forward need to be custom drafted with Indigenous people for Indigenous outcomes. So can I ask a, a tangible question to the four of you? about how do we how do we do this how do we ensure that indigenous people with expertise and cultural understanding are the ones that write these policies and design these programs what are the steps that in your experience work so that a government program would be by and for the community that would that would that needs it and will benefit from it. How, do you have examples of where that's happened? Maybe at a provincial level or a municipal level. First of all, we're all examples of that. I mean, if Sylvia were to narrate her history of getting into this industry and the leadership decisions that were required, there was probably no government agency going, how can we support you, dear Sylvia, <laughs> or Justin, or even Marie, uh, in, all, you know, in all likelihoods. And, and we're having this conversation, and I know Justin will reach out to Sylvia um, in, in another manner. But, but, but I think some tangible examples are exactly to look at those models that have been successful at the Ontario Aboriginal, at OFIFC, at the Aboriginal Housing Management Association, at tangible lived experiences like Marie's to say, let's just do it. Why are we waiting to ask for permission from government to create what we, we know we need? Why do we not come together and do what we know is needed and then say, here we are. Send the money. You Here's the answer. It, Margaret, have the, have the stories been uh, collected and told? Is that part of it that we just, that there are isolated examples and we haven't made the case? Or is there resistance in government? Or or what I wondered at the end, what you just said, if there were, were a funding envelope approach where the federal government makes money available to, to local communities, and then you determine how you spend it. I mean, that that is the opposite to paternalism, I think. <laughs> Justin, well, Justin is nodding, it, and maybe Sylvia. I don't know. Is there a fun? If, if we're lucky, it'll be maternalism. It's it's often well, paternalism. <laughs> it's it's often women from our community who come forward and and try to find the peace. So, so the the system the system has to change. There there needs to be an allocated model. It, it's reasonable. 
we're okay. we, we're spending billions of dollars in keeping people homeless. We could reframe that and say that part of the answer to that is to build the kind of housing that people are going to be comfortable in. They've done a great project in Winnipeg where they built a 20 some tiny homes for chronically um, homeless people, that means people who've been on the streets for years, and uh, and they built it on land that they have in one of the cultural centers, uh, the Thunderbird House, and uh, and all, all is going well, and people are going to be off the streets this winter, and, and they have a place, and they feel safe. They involve the people who are going to live in it, who who had who said, you know, we don't, we haven't ever felt safe anywhere. We don't feel safe at shelters, so, so don't, don't make windows big enough for people to break in, like, we need, mm -hmm. you know, it was interesting, the exercise, they, they exist. So the final, the final short answer is, we're trying to do it right now in the spheres that we're in. Margaret and myself and, and Justin are working. Uh, we're working uh, with the uh, Indigenous Caucus of, of Canadian Housing Renewal Association. Uh, we're working uh, with, with CMHC. And we're basically saying, you do your job. You get a successful cabinet document through, we'll give you all the information and we will do our job, which is bring the right people to the table and create an indigenous led culture based process that will work. And once and if you and if you keep doing it, because it's not a one off housing is something you need for your whole life, then we will promise you that there will be huge leaps forward in indigenous communities in this country and in indigenous families, because we'll be able to take care of our kids, to help our seniors, uh, to find what safe and culturally appropriate means for us. And we'll actually have our own self-determination. And sometimes that's all we need is our voice to be heard and for us to stand up as a collective for our people. In fact, we've been able to evidence through all of these models, Justin has his data that supports it. We have ours that we return on investment directly over 240% for every dollar to community, back to the broader community, for every dollar invested in urban indigenous housing strategies and solutions, we return 240, over 700% on social impacts return on investment. So there's no way to lose this if government could just get out of their own way Mm -hmm. and invest in the strategies we've already demonstrated. So it work. sounds to me like we've got success stories, we've got data, we've got models, we've got some myths that need to be debunked about capacity. We've got a commitment to hold governments accountable to commitments that they have verbally made but seem to have not been able to tangibly demonstrate. Are there any other key pieces of the puzzle, Justin and Marie, that we that, that the folks on the, the session today need to be mindful of. Any other key, oh, and land that we're gonna prioritize getting la public land allocated. Justin, Justin and Marie, any last thoughts from you about other key things that, need to, that we need to commit to? Hi, it's Marie, I wanna jump in on this one. Um, I think what would help is for the legal system to think about land differently. Um, as in many lots that people can actually afford to live in. I have a vision of all these little lots on the Don Valley Parkway on the green slope there with these little um, yep. hobbit houses on them. That's one. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I, I, I think, you know, just encouraging people to open their eyes, Marie. I mean, you've done that by saying, look at all the signs we have that prohibit people from having access. That's a very telling thing, signs. And then as you suggest, look at all the ways that different people try to make a home for themselves and to turn that into a more positive thing than a, a negative. I think these are very important points. Justin, what would you like to suggest? One more thing. Right now at this point, we need political action. Um, we saw how fast the, uh, the federal government could move during the, during the pandemic. And um, so we need to see that, that sort of quickness in action and commitment um, from the federal government with respect to urban indigenous housing it's doable yeah and we've all got to hold them accountable to that. i mean we are the government it's us right so we have to hold each other accountable margaret by popular demand one more time the book that you referred to that people should get on friday can you just pull it out to people again yeah it's this house is not a home from catlia 
this house is not a home from Katlia. We'll put it up on the Canner website. You can see it. Thank you so much for joining us, Sylvia, Justin, Marie, and Margaret. Really, what a really privilege for us to be able to have a time, an hour with you and for us to think and reflect now. And as you suggest, not just on Friday, every day in terms of actually putting into action what our truth and reconciliation process needs to be in this country. Really, the four of you were a great inspiration. Thank you so much for sharing the time. Nice to see you again. And, and I look forward, you know, it's never the end. This is just the beginning. The conversation continues. Thanks, everybody.